another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And guess what I forgot to do? Take up the offering. Um, Gary, I guess you're up on that. All right. All right, yeah, well. You, you just ask the blessing privately out there if you want to or whatever. Sorry about that. Got carried away. All right, the title of the lesson is Isaiah's Commission. And the golden text is, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of the hosts. The whole earth is filled of his glory. Isaiah 6.3. In our exposition, we have the prophet's vision and the time of the vision. Isaiah had his vision of the Lord's holiness in the year that King Uzziah died. This time notation could refer to any time up to a year prior to Uzziah's death or a year after his death. The vision occurred at a turning point in Judah's history. King Uzziah, also called Azariah, had a prosperous reign of 52 years. However, becoming unduly proud of his accomplishments, Uzziah later in his reign usurped the place of the priests and tried to burn incense in the temple. The Lord struck him with leprosy, and he had to turn over his authority to Jotham, his son. Thus, the once mighty king came to an ignominious end. And um, that is a prime example of how you can spend your entire life building up uh, your name and building up your legacy and trying to do the right thing and honor God. And and with one act, you can tear that all down. It's so easy. Um, It's very hard to build a reputation and to spend your life doing the right thing, but it's easy to tear it all down uh, quickly. And that's what Uzziah did. Um, All throughout his 52 years as king, he honored the Lord and the Lord blessed him. And the Lord gave him victory and gave him peace and gave him uh, a a prosperous reign. But eventually that started to go to his head and he forgot where it was that his strength truly came from. And he started to feel... um, he started to think of himself too highly and he thought that he was good enough because of all his accomplishments to go into the temple and take on the priestly role and that just was not the way God ordained things to be. Uh, It was wrong and it was sinful and in doing that, uh, everything that he had built came crashing down uh, so quickly and so swiftly. It's a sad, sad story and it's something that we're all in danger of. Um, as we go throughout this life and God gives us uh, victories and he he fights our battles for us and he prospers us, uh, we're always in danger of forgetting where it is that our help has come from. And we're in danger of getting a big head and thinking too highly of ourselves. And the minute that we forget that it's only God who gives us these things, That's the minute that we're in serious trouble, and that's what happened to Uzziah. If we are to judge from the first five chapters of Isaiah, as well as from Micah, which was written a little later, the spiritual conditions in Judah were once again deplorable. This would have been God's judgment on them, presumably for what Uzziah had done, and, um, you know, he, he raises up good and bad kings for a purpose. So... The situation was not good, but as we talked about last week with Samuel, you can look at a culture who's in uh, moral decay and in trouble, and you can either think that there's no hope, 
Or you can look at it through the lens of the Bible and see that every time things are at their worst, that's when God sends his most faithful servants to come and uh, do his work. So when, like we are today, when our culture and our world is in such uh, bad shape and you can't distinguish right from wrong out in the culture, we're in a perfect place for God to raise up a faithful servant to go and preach his word and do his work. Um, the fields are ripe for harvest right now. on God's sovereignty and his power to carry out his will. However, his covenant name, Yahweh, occurs in verses 3 and 5. Isaiah was no doubt impressed with the Lord's transcendent power in contrast with the fleeting and limited authority of earthly kings. We'll talk about that more in a minute probably. When Isaiah saw the Lord, he did not actually see his essence, for that is impossible. Because of the holiness of God, you cannot look on him. You'll just disintegrate, basically, if you were to look on him in his fullness. Um, perhaps he saw a human-like form seated on a throne. The Gospel of John informs us that this was none other than Christ appearing in his pre-incarnate glory. And you can read that reference there in uh, John chapter 12 and verse 37. I don't know based on that exactly if that confirms that that. Jesus is who Isaiah saw here, but there's plenty of examples in the Old Testament uh, where you can make the case that, that the pre-incarnate Christ showed up and people saw him and communed with him. So um, very possible that it was Jesus that he saw in this vision here, but we don't know for sure. Um, the throne on which he sat was high and lifted up. And, you know, that represents that God's authority and his reign and his power is so far above anything of earthly authority and power. There's no throne or no office in this world that can even reach the foot of God's throne because he's just so far. He's the one who puts uh, the men and women that are in power in those positions, and he rules over everything sovereignly, and there's no, there's no position as high or even close to as high as his. And the train of his flowing robe, filled the entire temple. Now, Dad and Chad both, uh, I would say a year or so ago, preached a sermon about this. And um, if you don't know, the train of the robe of a king, um, the longer that train was, would have represented how many battles had been won by that king. So basically, when a king uh, sent his armies out to battle against another nation, if they were victorious, then what that king would do is he would go and take the robe of the king of the nation that he had conquered and he would have it sewn onto the back of his robe. So when you saw a king walking around with a robe that stretched back uh, really far, it was an indication that they had been victorious in many battles and they had conquered many nations. So Isaiah looks at the Lord sitting on his throne and he sees his robe and the train of his robe fills the entire temple and that's an indication of the eternal victory of God because there's no end to the battles that he has won. Um, how many here this morning know that God has never or will never lose any battle that he ever takes part in? He is always victorious over his enemies every time and that's what this, this long train represents here. And what an encouraging thing to see um, evidence of a God who never loses because that's the God that we serve. And when he says that he'll fight for you, that he'll send his armies to fight on your behalf, you know that victory is assured in that case. It doesn't mean that everything's going to go smoothly and we're always going to get our way, but we know that the ultimate victory in this life is ours because God is fighting on our behalf.
and it'll be used against you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. Absolutely. Since this was a vision, uh, since this was a vision, the temple was probably not Solomon's temple. Rather, it was God's heavenly dwelling where he was attended by heavenly beings. And that makes the filling up of that temple even more magnificent because it didn't just fill up a man-made temple, but it filled up the heavenly temple that God abides in. Um, above the throne stood the seraphims. Here the English plural ending is unnecessary, for M is already plural in Hebrew. This is the only explicit mention of seraphim in the Bible. They are evidently one of several categories of angels. The name comes from a Hebrew word that means to burn. So they are probably bright and dazzling in appearance. And we might be tempted to think that's because the angels themselves are glorious or majestic, but really it's kind of like Moses. When Moses went up on the mountain and spent time with God, he came down and his face was shining so bright that the Israelites couldn't even look at him. He had to put a veil on. So the reason that these angels would shine so bright is because for all eternity they have been uh, spending time in the presence of God. And when you spend time in the presence of God, his glory is reflected off of you. And the same is true for us today, not physically speaking, because we're not in the physical presence of God in that way. But if we spend time with him in his word and in prayer, and with the closer we get to him, his glory is going to shine forth in our lives in that when people see us, they're going to say, hey, there's something different about those people. They live their lives in a different way. They're going through hardships, but they still have joy and peace. Um, they're honest in the way they deal with people. And uh, people will see his spirit shining forth in you the more intimate you are with him. And, the, you know, the angels and Moses, when he was with God, that's a physical representation of, of how, that, this, how it works spiritually. So the closer you are with God and the more intimate, the more his glory is going to shine forth in your life. Go ahead, Dad. There is. Yeah, yeah, your behavior. And listen, there are there are times that you can just look at somebody. You, you can just look at them and you can you can kind of say, "Hey, I believe that's a Christian right there." Um, the way they carry themselves, they they look like they serve. Uh, the one true God. Um, so yeah, that, and that's you know that's why the Bible says that you'll know them by their fruits. You should be able to, you you ought to be able to look at me and see that I'm a Christian and that I spend time with God. And if you can't see that, then I'm doing something wrong. So you actually hold them out in a light, and through the days they actually absorb that light, and when they're in darkness. It, you see the contrast between the two of them. It's not a generator of light, but it has absorbed that light hmm. for dark times. Wow. Well, that's how we are in the world. Christ said we are the light of the world. We can't have a light unless we absorb his light. Absorb and he becomes part of him. So even as you 
preached your first message about how that we are to decrease, that Christ would increase, as John the Baptist stated. Even today, we are the same way. Yeah. Uh, we, he is in us, and as long as we continue to stay in his presence, it will naturally come out in everything that we do. Amen. That's a good illustration with the glow sticks. I, I never thought of that. But yeah, they, they absorb the light, and then they can shine forth in the darkness, and that's how it is for us. We don't have any light of our own. Only the light that we get from being in God's presence, and then that light can shine forth. And glow sticks, I know I'm back here making a big mess out of things, but you know them glow sticks never shine until they're broken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they have to be broken. You, you break them. When you come to the Lord with a broken heart, with a contrite spirit, you actually will start to shine. Amen. Amen. Wow. That's huge. So good. Isaiah saw the seraphim, whether few or many, we do not know, hovering above God's throne. They covered their faces and feet with their wings in reverence to him. With the remaining two wings, they flew. <laughs> so they had four wings that were just dedicated to shielding their eyes from the sheer glory of God. And, and we, man, we treat God so casually, don't we? we? We forget sometimes how holy and how glorious he really is. If the angels who have been up there with him all this time have to shield their faces in His presence for His glory. Um, you know, we, we could we could give God a whole lot more respect and fear than we give Him. Thus, Isaiah had a glimpse into the heavenly abode of God, where the glory of even the brightest creatures pales before His glory. What a powerful thing for Isaiah to see, and we'll see in a minute how it affects him. The proclamation of God's holiness. The seraphim cried out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. This probably means that two groups of angels spoke antiphonally to each other. The title they used was the Lord of hosts or Yahweh of armies. It implies that the armies of heaven are constantly at his command. And we've already touched on this. Um, you remember when Jesus uh, was in the garden and Peter tried to cut off that guy's ear, Jesus said, now, hold on now. Don't you know that if I needed help, all I'd have to do is ask my father and he would send thousands of angels to fight on my behalf. So let us never forget that God is in command and in control of the largest army in all ever, that there's ever been or ever will be. And we are not alone or outmatched if we're his, ever. We are never outmatched by Satan and his armies because God's army is always greater and God's army is always ready to be sent out when he says for them to go out and to fight on his behalf and on behalf of his children. The word holy means completely set apart. God is separate from and transcendent over all his creation, both his essence and his moral purity. He cannot be compared with anything the human mind can conceive, and it is impossible for him to tolerate sin. So when I was doing my notes and stuff and study, and I, I, my first thought was that the holiness of God is one of his most important traits, but... That's not really accurate because the holiness of God is not a trait. It's who he is. The holiness of God is, is everything that God is and his character and all that he, all that he is. It's his essence. His holiness um, means that he, like the, the, the lesson says here, that he is above and beyond everything that we could ever imagine. Our minds cannot even comprehend God and his holiness and his glory. Um, his wisdom surpasses anything that we could ever imagine. His ways are higher than our ways. His power is greater than anything we could ever know. And in the most important thing about his holiness is that his holiness prevents him from making mistakes or from sinning and doing evil against us. If we had a God as powerful as he was but was not holy, we'd be in serious trouble because we'd have a God with that unlimited power 
but one that was able to make mistakes and to do evil. So we should thank God every day that he is holy and that he's limited. And, in, in, you know, God can't lie. He can't go back on his word. There, there are things, actually, that God can't do. And he can't violate his own holiness and his own character. And that's a huge blessing to us. But his holiness also does create a problem for us because we're not holy. So because God's holy and we're sinful, we can't stand in his presence as we are because he cannot tolerate sin. But uh, he gives Isaiah here in this vision and in how he handles him afterwards, um, he gives him a glimpse into how he's going to settle that problem once and for all and how he takes the initiative and bridges that gap for us between his holiness and our sinfulness. And we'll get into that as we go on. Why did the seraphim repeat the word three times? The repetition may hint at the Trinity, but was most likely used for emphasis, calling attention to the fullness of God's holiness. So three is, you know, there's kind of a completion in the number three. And um, it was their way of, you know, expressing the fullness and the perfectness of his holiness. But although he is totally unlike his creation, God has not separated himself from it. The whole earth is full of his glory. The Hebrew more literally reads, the fullness of all the earth is his glory. The whole earth is the theater in which the splendor of his attributes is displayed. Those who dwell on it have ample opportunity to see this divine witness. Now if you... You have to be willfully blind, really, to go through this world and never see the glory of God in it. When you're driving down the road and you look up at a beautiful blue sky and the sun's sitting over the mountains, you're seeing the glory of God in his creation there. When you hold your baby and you look down into their sweet little face, you see the glory of God in his creation. And he is holy. It's not an attribute. It's not a trait. Even so is the life. He talks about all the earth. Sees, we see his glory in all the earth. It's the life. Yeah. Every living creature, every organism, everything that lives is because of him. Yeah. And we so ignorantly dismiss who he actually is that we want to kick him out. Listen, if he honors our desires and what we say and he would leave, we would die and yeah. cease to exist 100%. because he is life. Now, Jesus clarified that when he said "In the, the life is in the Father. Yeah. And he has given the Son that life that whomsoever he will, he can give that life. So wrap your minds around that is that if he truly honored who we was, and completely left, everything would cease to exist. It would cease to exist because he is life. Yeah. And he has made a way because he's that holy, he sent his son into the world that through him, now we have access back to that life. Amen. Thank so, God for that. So, yeah, uh, great point. All life is a reflection of God's glory and of our need for him. And, you know, it's just, when you go out at night, on a clear night and you look up at the sky and you, you can just look up and from your little place that you're in and you can see hundreds or probably thousands of stars and you know that even what you see there is only a tiny, tiny portion of what there is out there. Um, does that not show the power of God and, and the greatness and the glory and the majesty of him? And all this stuff, uh, creation is just a tiny, tiny portion of his glory and his greatness, but it's all around us. You can't, I can't sit here right now without looking at all of you guys. And if, I, if I'm honest, I see the glory of God and everybody that's here today because uh, not only did he create you and he sustained you all this time, but everybody here this morning that I know of is a Christian. And I'm seeing the glory of God and people that were once lost and separated from him but have now been brought back into a relationship with him. So um, you, know, you don't have to look far to see evidence of God and his glory in this world.
watch that cabbage. Yeah. I mean, it starts out with a little seed, and then the next thing you know, you get a leaf here, and then, and it just, I told him, I said, there is nobody but God that can do that. That can make that happen, yeah. I said, so I would use something like that to kind of get his attention. Yeah. And I mean, he raised a great garden. Hmm. He really did. Yeah. And if you can't see God in something just by looking at it, yeah. you're blind. Everything we see reflects his glory. Everything. You really do. When I'm driving home from Pikeville every day after work, and I, I look at the mountains and stuff, I, I just think, man, what a, you know, what a wonderful God that He carved out all this, all this beautiful stuff, and and set us down in it. When you look for His glory, you're going to see it everywhere you turn. The problem is that we're not always looking for it. The awesome scene before Isaiah was enhanced by physical manifestations. The post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. Second, the temple was filled with smoke. The presence of the Lord is often associated with smoke, for he is a consuming fire. At Sinai, Israel saw a mountain that both smoked and quaked. In this case, the smoke may have risen from incense on the altar, for we know such an altar was a part of Isaiah's vision. Whatever its source, the accumulation of all that Isaiah had seen and heard left him awestruck and humbled. And let me read this next part and we'll talk about that. The prophet's response acknowledging sin. The heavenly vision of Isaiah, the, the heavenly vision brought Isaiah to a devastating examination of himself, and he cried, Woe is me for I am undone. Now, this to me, to be awestruck and humbled and to cry, woe is me, this is the only genuine way to respond to an encounter with God like this. When you come, uh, let, let me say this, when you hear people going around boasting about these great visions that they've had and these things that God showed them and they're just so proud and so cheerful and happy about it, be, be careful. I'll just say that. Be careful of what you listen to and put stock into because you never read in the Bible of somebody encountering God in one of these visions that they didn't come away terrified and humbled. Daniel, when he was faced with these things, he laid out on the ground and he couldn't even speak because he was so terrified. All these people, and, and even in the New Testament when... Uh, Peter and John and James were up on the mountain with Jesus and they saw what they saw. They were terrified because the glory of God showed them how rotten and how dirty and how small that they were. See, his holiness as the, the fire and all the smoke and stuff as it burned up the sin yeah. Yeah. around him because he's so holy. Yeah. And I and you look at his temple and stuff, and you mentioned the incense of prayer as a smoke ascending. You wonder if when he seen that, he thought, oh, my gosh, everything that he thought was good is being burned up in front of him because he's that holy. I mean, yeah. no wonder he quaked. Yeah, absolutely. So when, when you have an encounter with God, the only appropriate response is to be humbled. And... Isaiah says, woe is me. He didn't say, uh, man, I must be pretty special to have been able to see this or um, I must be doing something right if God would show me something this uh, amazing. He says, woe is me for I am undone. He said, I can't stand in the presence of this and um, there's no way I can even live in, his pre in the presence of someone so holy and so wonderful. He who would be called to pronounce woes on others had to first see himself in the same hopeless condition. That's a really, really good statement in our lesson here. And so when, when we as teachers and ministers 
or just us as Christians and we go out and witness to the lost, know that we are not looking down on you and judging you when we um, speak about your sin and we speak about your need for a Savior. It's only that we ourselves have come face to face with our own hopelessness and sinfulness. Before we ever come to the Lord. Exactly, yeah. Even on the carnal side, people that are worldly, even as I was in the world, we would look at people and cast judgment on them and wouldn't even realize that we didn't check ourselves. Well, right. what, have, what is our part in the whole situation? Yeah. We immediately are defensive and hurt because somebody done X, Y, Z to us and give it a few months and we turn around and do the same thing and say, I can't believe that them dirty rock scoundrels will do that to me. Yeah. And didn't realize we just done it to somebody else. Yeah. I mean, in asking for forgiveness. So this whole encounter right here is very applicable to everybody that lives. Yeah. I mean, first... Should we not see where we stand before we ever start casting stones at other people? Absolutely. But when, you know, when we say, hey, listen, you're lost and you need a Savior, it's, it's not because we think we're better than you. It's because we've been where you are. We, we at one point came face to face with our own sinfulness and with the glory of God and His holiness, and we realized that we had a big problem and that we needed help or we were in serious trouble. And it's because we've been through that that we can now say to you, hey, you are in serious trouble and you need help. And people, you know, people say, uh, there's debates about certain sins in the world, and we won't get specific right now, but people say, you know, why is what, what I do any worse than what you do? It, it's not. The difference is, is that we know that what we are and what we do is wrong. And we have asked God to forgive us of that, and we are continually trying to repent and turn away from that. We're not pretending like the things that we do are okay and that we can be in good standing with God while we're uh, dirty and sinful, but that we need him to cleanse us. I was battling a illness of cancer, and I found out that there was a sure way to cure me. And then I go back out and tell other people, listen, I know what you've got. He, he's got it. But the problem is, is until they recognize what they have, yeah. they'll never hear what the remedy is because it don't affect me. And the same, we were the same way. We were the same uh, way. I justified everything I did. I, you know, I said, well, yeah, God, God won't send me. The classic, the classic excuse, God won't send me to the same place that he sends a bunch of murderers and rapists and stuff because what I do is not that bad. That That's the lie that we tell ourselves when we're living in sin. And that's... That's the lie that the lost people are believing today. They just say, well, I, I do my best. I'm not that bad. I've never, I don't hurt anybody. I don't, I don't cheat people. Um, I try my best to be a good person. It's, it's not enough because God's too holy. And it's not about the things that you do. It's about who you are. As uh, Deep down in your soul, you're sinful and you're rebellious against God and you need him to clean you. And we're going to see it's what he does for Isaiah. We've got to hurry up, though. To say that he was undone meant that he saw himself as cut off and doomed. That's how we feel when we see the holiness of God and our sinfulness. Isaiah was especially mortified that he was a man of unclean lips who lived in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He had just heard the seraphim proclaiming God's holiness, and he sensed he ought to be doing the same. But his sinfulness made him unfit to do so. His lips were unclean because his heart was also unclean. So at what comes out of our mouth is a representation of what is in our heart. And Isaiah wanted to proclaim the goodness of God, but he was not worthy to because of his sinfulness. It is possible for us as God's people today to have unclean lips in God's sight. Through our lips we may bring forth filth, profanity, gossip, hatred, and lies. But even if we avoid these, our very prayers and expressions of worship may be unclean to him because our hearts are insincere. And we may remain unaware of this because we have ignored the Bible, God's revelation of himself. A mere glimpse of his holiness should bring us to our knees. Uh, we could get into some stuff there, but I'm going to move on so we can try to um, wrap it up. Receiving cleansing. Isaiah expected to die because of his sin, but God had a better alternative. 
he would cleanse him and make him useful in his service. Now let me read real quick. I preached a message on this about a year ago, I think. Um, I'm going to read Isaiah, or not Isaiah, Zechariah chapter 3 real quick in this little story of another vision that God gave a prophet um, during this time. And he showed me uh, Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. So to me, this story with Zechariah and Joshua the high priest is really similar to what's going on with Isaiah here. Because Zechariah was in the temple doing the work of the high priest and he was wearing filthy garments. His clothes were not clean, which was a big deal at that time. And Isaiah here is standing before the Lord, recognizing his own uncleanliness. And both of them knew that the consequences of this were dire. They knew that God would be completely justified uh, as they stand in his presence, filthy as they were, he would be justified in striking them down right then and there. But in both cases, God takes the initiative and cleans up those who could not clean themselves. The ones who were standing before him filthy and without any hope in the world, he goes to them and he says, hey, I'm going to cleanse you so that you can serve me and so that you can stand before me blameless. And, um, and that is all of that in the Old Testament is a shadow of what he would do for all of us in Christ as he takes the initiative and in coming down and taking upon this flesh and dying on the cross for our sins. And he cleans us so that we can serve him and so that we can be a part of his family. The Lord responded by sending one of the seraphim to cleanse him. He came to Isaiah carrying a burning coal that he had picked up from the altar with a pair of tongs. If this was indeed a piece of coal, it was not the mineral we know today, but charcoal made from wood through a process of partial oxidation. But the Hebrew word often refers to a hot stone Such heated stones were used on the altar of incense. The seraph placed the glowing stone on Isaiah's lips, since this was the part of his body that he confessed was unclean. The angel then declared, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. This purging fire, this purging by fire, was administered by a heavenly being whose name was Seraph, meant burning one. But the fire did not come from him. It was the holy fire taken from the incense altar of God. And you remember when John the Baptist is out baptizing people and he tells them, uh, hey, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Fire is always used, um, as it says on down in our lesson, as an agent of purification. And it references how the silversmiths would use fire to heat up what they were working on and bring all the impurities up to the surface until actually they could see their own reflection in what they were working on and they knew that it was complete. That's a good picture of what God does with us. But um, the fire that was used to cleanse Isaiah is the same fire that the Lord cleanses us with when he baptizes us with his Holy Spirit So um, Isaiah goes on and he hears the call of God and after he's cleaned, he accepts the call and he goes on to do what the Lord would tell him to do and he never received much earthly glory for it or much appreciation from the people that he ministered to. But he obeyed God nonetheless. But um, just remember this morning, 
uh, you are sinful, you are filthy, and, and you can't stand before a holy God, but he has made a way that you can. He has made a way that he can cleanse you by the blood of his Son and by the power of his Holy Spirit and enable you to stand before him and to serve him and to do what it is that he's called you to do. So thank God for his word this morning. Thank you all for your help. Uh, looks like we had 43 in attendance and 62 in the offering this morning, and we thank God for everybody that's here and for your generosity. Um, as we said earlier, we are not going to have next Sunday morning, we're not going to have Sunday school for the youth.
sound and the video. I think we're live now. So we do want to say welcome to those that may be watching now or whenever you're watching. <coughs> welcome to Canada Free Will Baptist Church, our June the 12th morning worship service. And listen, let's transition from the prayer request and uh, to, to the praise. And let's praise the Lord. I'd like to ask you, uh, I know we got a good number. Is there anybody else that would want to come up and kind of help us in the choir and sing? Does, now, does Alex sing, or does he just like to sit back there? And see? He can come up and stand with us and sing if he wants to. Yeah, we're so glad to have him and you guys today. It's awesome to have you. Yeah, it's all right. He's, he's welcome to if he wants to. Anybody else? Yeah, thank you guys. Come up and help us sing. What what page number do we have here? 333. Um, what we need to yell on them, Justin? I probably might have turned it on. Okay, yeah. Page 333. Please join us. Help us sing. Great, 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 great,
national songs. Now, I don't know if we sounded as good to you all as what you all sounded to us. Man, you all sounded good singing back there. Praise the Lord today. We worship him in spirit and truth. He's worthy, ain't he? Has he done anything for you today? Has he, has he, has he brought you out of places you didn't think you'd ever come out of? Has he lifted you up and established you when you were on shaky ground? Has he pulled you out of the miry clay and set you on a solid foundation? Has he done anything for your family today? Has he rescued your children? Has he took care of your parents? Has he raised up a community around you? Don't you want to praise him today? He's done for us what nobody else could ever do. He's given us a home in glory. And I got to tell you, beyond that, there's nothing beyond greater than that. But until we get there, he has left the Holy Spirit, Brother Jack, to dwell inside of the heart of the believer. A third part of the Godhead is living inside you today. And I believe that third part this morning wants to shout out to the Lord how good he is today. If he's done something for you, you ought to testify. If you got a song in your heart, you ought to sing a song this morning. Is there anything at all you want to do for the Lord? You ought to do it today. You don't know if you have tomorrow, right? So if God's been good to you, worship him. How do you choose to worship him today? Yeah. You want to sing, brother? Oh, I love it. Come on, brother. Yeah. Come on. Hey. Yeah, hey, listen, just enough time for somebody to stand up and say, I love the Lord while he's getting that ready. Anybody? Amen. Amen. And I know it's Yes. We got people testifying, all popcorn testifying. Jackie's loving the Lord. Yeah. Yeah, brother, sister back there loving the Lord. This is good today. Thank you, Lord. Here's what happens. You say, we want to have good church service, we want to be encouraged. The Bible said when we lift him up, he'll draw. Praise the Lord today. Praise the Lord. Yes, bless our brother. I'm usually saying this much. Sister asked me to. You say your brother. Amen. I'll pray. Y'all pray for me. <coughs> Take this just a second. Again, we're house pulling double duty back there. <coughs>
Somebody back there, you guys in your heart, come with a song to sing? Just want to sing? I mean, Lord, have mercy. You're probably just going to have to do everything over top of me today. Just come on. And I might just stand up and walk around. And Sometimes you got to. Yeah, yeah. It's just, yeah. Man, oh man, every now and then it just comes out. Randy's got a new guitar. You sing with the new guitar. Yes, yes. He's got a birthday. New car, new guitar. My goodness. Pray for Brittany. He sings for him. Amen. Thank the Lord for it. Thank you, Lord.
I think it's more the player than the... Oh, <laughs> oh I'm a traveler Far from home I get lost But I press on There's a mansion And streets of gold this little church and let us feel what heaven on earth would be. Oh, oh my. Oh, my. But it dawned on me that Christ came in the building in our hearts. Yes. We brought him in, brother. And then it dawned, it said, release me. 
Oh. So, for us to release him, what we have to do? We yeah. have to let his glove flow from breast to breast. Yeah. Amen. There you go, brother. Yeah. yeah. So if we want to feel that heaven on earth, that's what we have. Release him. Oh, Just yeah. release him and let I him do it. his work. Yeah. I love it, brother. Yes, sir. life shall end and hear a sweet sound sing child and ring oh. you want crown wow. such mercy crown if king of all kings then I'll shout hallelujah my joy is complete when I lay my crown at the master's feet
tears began to fall. Was been home for several months now. Soon become too small. Cause the news just came this morning. There's gonna be a son. They cry and tell each other. songs have been a blessing to your soul that I believe they've lifted up in the name of Jesus. Give us some encouragement today for those of us that have been born by the blood of Jesus. Pastor Jack, this is as bad as it gets. This is the only hill that we would ever know. For those of you that have not made peace with Jesus, and if you never do, Think about this. This would be the only heaven that you ever know. Would that not break your heart? I would be sad for you today. It don't have to end like that. Today's a new day. Today's your day. If you hear his voice, the Bible says, don't harden your heart. If God's calling you to be a Christian today and you know you're lost, God's calling you, we want to invite you to come to the altar in just a few minutes and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Some things you don't know about that transpired yesterday. Some of you don't know this, and I want to enlighten you. Number one, no certain order. Gary Stewart is the moderator for this year's conference, the Pike County Conference. And yours truly, through Gary Stewart, had been selected to serve as the assistant moderator. Yeah. So you got two people here in the, your own church that are helping with the conference uh, this year. Um, the second thing that you might not know about is you're hosting the conference in August. <laughs> so get ready. We're going to host the conference in August, and it'll be a wonderful thing. And the third thing that you might not know about is that Justin went before the ordination council yesterday, and it was their recommendation to the conference that he be ordained as a minister in the Pike County Conference. 
And so the conference voted to accept that, and Justin is now ordained by the Pike County Conference uh, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mainly, he's ordained by God, right? But this helps him with some things that he needs to do. So, so there's no way we could let our newest ordained minister not preach this morning, right? So, uh, so Justin's going to come and share God's word with you. Please pray for him. Pray for him. And if you're here and you're lost, we're praying for you. We love you this morning. May God bless you. Pray for Justin. Y'all please pray because I spent all week when I wasn't at VBS chasing after them heathens, <coughs> I spent all week uh, reading the conference bylaws and uh, preparing to be ordained. So I didn't have a whole lot of time to study this week, but um, we'll do what the Lord blesses me to do. i um, going to be in Luke chapter 14 and starting in verse, let's just start in verse 16. So Luke 14, 16. We'll read a few verses there. Luke 14, 16. And then he, he being Jesus, said unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. He didn't even ask to be excused from that one. He said, the boss has done said I won't be there. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded and there is yet room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And there went a great multitude with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Thank God for his word, and let's pray real quick. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your son. And I just pray, God, that you would uh, give me the strength and the wisdom to preach your word today and to, to quieten down when you're ready for me to. And if there's any loss, God, um, help me to say whatever needs to be said to draw them towards you. For your son's sake, amen. amen. I think um, <laughs> when we read this story, a lot of us um, can be familiar with that kind of situation. Um, how many times have you invited somebody to something, be it a... Uh, to church or out to dinner or to a party, and they half-heartedly assure you that they're going to be there, but you and they both know that there's no chance they're going to be there. You can tell by the look on their face, the tone of their voice, they have no intention of coming. And then when the day rolls around, they either ghost you completely or they make an excuse as to why they can't go. And I, I myself am guilty of being on the bad end of that sometimes because... I've got a lot of uh, dad in me, and I don't really like to disappoint people to their face. I'd rather do it from afar. Um, so I have at times told people, yeah, sure, I'll be there. And in my mind, I'm thinking, not a chance. And I've even made things come up so that I don't have to honor that commitment. And, you know, there is a practical lesson uh, in this story, uh, and that's not what we're going to talk about today, but there is a practical lesson in that we need to be careful what commitments we make as Christians. You know, when we as representatives of God's kingdom say that we're going to be somewhere at a certain time or that we're going to do something, I think we're obligated to keep that commitment. If you're not willing to do that, then maybe don't make that commitment to begin with. That's just a little practical piece of advice. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. So Jesus, when he shares this parable, he was talking uh, he was actually at a dinner at a Pharisee's house, 
and um, that's the people who he was talking to. So he was at sort of a banquet, a kind of fancy uh, uppity banquet, if you will. And uh, so it was a practical uh, illustration of God's kingdom at that time in the place that he was at. And um, he tells this story of a man who goes out and invites... Um, will you go sit down, please? Thank you. <laughs> Excuse my baby there. Um, he gives this illustration of these people who... Uh, this man who goes out and hosts a dinner. And at, at this time, what they would do, they didn't have clocks and, and schedules and stuff, really. So they would go out several days before, and they would tell their closest friends, hey, I'm hosting a dinner... Um, and I'd really like for you to come. And it would have been a big ordeal. Uh, you know, it would have been uh, an honor to be invited to something like this. And um, so what they would do, they would go out days in advance, and they would invite who they were going to invite, and they would maybe give them a general time as to when the banquet was going to take place. Um, but they wouldn't know for sure, so the people who had agreed to come, you guys who have hosted parties and stuff know that you need to have a good idea of how many guests are going to be there so you know how much food to make and how much room to have and all that good stuff. And so the people who had agreed to come, uh, they were honor-bound to come to this banquet. When the servant came out and said, hey, it's time to come and eat, the banquet's ready, come and fulfill your obligation, and, uh, and, and the, the, the banquet's ready. So it would have been a serious insult for them to agree to be there, and then the host go and prepare them a place and prepare their food, and then the day of the party come up and say, well, I, I'm not going to be there. But Jesus wasn't really talking here about a physical banquet. He was using that as an illustration because the man had asked him right before this, he said, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. So they're not talking about a banquet in a wealthy person's house or a big fancy dinner. They're talking about, if you read in Isaiah chapter 25, and I'll read it real quick, Isaiah prophesies, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, and of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined, and he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all the people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the re rebuke of his people shall he take away from all the earth. For the Lord hath spoken it. That's Isaiah chapter 25 and verses 6 through 8. So when Jesus is speaking of this banquet that he's inviting the people to. Um, it, it's a picture of that banquet that the Lord has invited his people to in the Old Testament. And you can, you can look at the parable here as the Lord of the Supper being God, and then he sends his servant out to let the people know that a banquet is going to take place. And that would be the prophets of the Old Testament who came and prophesied, hey, the Messiah is going to come, and he is going to restore our fellowship with God, and we're even going to have this great big dinner and banquet with him, and we're going to enjoy intimate fellowship with him. And the Jewish people claimed to be looking forward to that day. They said, well, if God's hosting a banquet, we're going to be there, and we're excited for it, and whenever he tells us that it's time to go, we'll be there. But then Jesus Christ is born of a virgin, and he comes into this world, and he begins to go to his own people and says, hey, the time of the Lord is at hand and it's time to gather up the people for the banquet because I'm bringing you now into the kingdom. I'm the one who was promised and I've come to restore your fellowship with God and to wipe away your iniquities. But we see when Jesus comes, the Bible says that he came into his own and his own received him not. So those who in the Old Testament claimed to be looking forward to the coming of the Messiah and to being invited to this banquet, uh, turned him away. And for whatever excuses they may have come up with, they did not answer the call that they had agreed to answer when they were first invited to the banquet. So when Jesus tells the parable, he tells about three men as an example who did not meet their obligation and come to the banquet. And we're going to go through these and see um, how that can relate to us today. 
The first man that he went to was unable to attend because he had purchased a piece of land and he needed to go see it. That to me seems like a really lame excuse because if he had already purchased the land, odds are he's already seen the land. And if he'd already purchased the land, the land would still be there after the banquet. So he could have very well went after the banquet, met his obligations, and went out and surveyed the land. Why didn't he do that, though? Because the land that Jesus talks about in this parable represents the man's possessions. And he was more concerned with his possessions than he was attending the banquet that the Lord had invited him to. He was more concerned with his things and with the things that he owned than he was with doing what was right and to go into this banquet. And we always run a risk today of turning our possessions into idols. We live in a very materialistic world uh, where you've got to have the latest and greatest of everything, the newest and the shiniest. And it's easy for us to get caught up in our possessions and to allow them to take the throne of our hearts and to become our idol. We can do it many different ways. Maybe we're more concerned with our yards being well kept and our cars clean. Thank God that's not something I struggle with. I could care less. But maybe we'll skip out on Sunday morning service so that we can wash our cars and cut our grass and make sure everything's good. Or maybe just in our chasing of possessions, we can neglect uh, the, the work that we need to be doing in the kingdom. Maybe we can spend too much time on our phones and watching our TVs and neglect our Bible reading and prayer time. There are a bunch of ways that we can let our possessions get between us and God. And it makes you think of the rich young man that came to Jesus. Um, and he came to him and said, hey, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, well, all you have to do, you know the commandments, obey the commandments. This guy must have been a real good guy because he said, yeah, I've kept them all perfectly. I say he's probably full of it, but... Um, he said that he did, and Jesus says, well, okay, if you've kept the commandments, you need to do one more thing. You need to go out and you need to sell everything that you own, and then give the proceeds to the poor, and then come back and follow me. And all accounts of this man say that he never did that. They say that he went away sorrowful because he had many possessions. He allowed his love of his possessions to prevent him from taking part in the banquet of the Lord. The second man was unable to attend because he had purchased five yoke of oxen and needed to go and prove them. Again, this could have waited till after the banquet they were his, so it was a lame excuse. And the oxen would have represented financial interests because they would have been farmers and the oxen would have been used to till the fields and to prepare their farmland and they would have been a big source of income for the man. So he was more concerned with financial gain than going and being a part of the kingdom. And again, um, we are told in the Bible that actually if we don't provide for our families, we're worse than an unbeliever. So it's very important that we go out and earn a good living and we provide for our families. But the love of money, church, is the root of all evil. And when we become more concerned with our pursuit of wealth than our pursuit of the kingdom of God, we're in serious trouble and money has become our idol. We can um, be so concerned, maybe we can get a few extra hours. I understand people have to work certain days of the week and you, when you're employed you've got to do what you've got to do. But if you have an option to maybe go out and get a few hours of overtime on Sunday or you could come to church, you ought to come to church really because God will make up for what you're giving up if you put him first. So do not allow... Uh, Pursuing wealth and financial gain. Don't, don't, let, don't let yourself become morally corrupt. You could cheat people and not do what's right in the eyes of God to make a few extra bucks. And then money becomes your idol and you've let that get in between you and the Lord. And the third man, he couldn't attend because he had just gotten married. Now, out of all these, I sympathize with this guy the most. I have to be honest. Because I can just imagine when I got married, if I told Cass, hey, glad we're married, but the honeymoon's going to have to wait till next weekend because Anthony's invited me to, to go and eat with him, and I'm going to have to do that first. And she wouldn't have to say a word. She'd just give me a look, and I'd say, well, I'm going to call Anthony and cancel that, and we'll go. So I understand this man, but um, this guy let his family get in between him and doing what was right. 
And I think of all the things that we're at risk of creating an idol out of, our family probably are the most dangerous because our family is our number one priority beneath God. God has commanded us to lead and to shepherd and to love our families and to always put their interests above basically everything else except for the kingdom. And when you have kids, and especially if you have multiple kids, Boo and BB, you guys know, a lot of you know, your interests are pulled in so many different directions because there's always somebody that needs something. You're always going to appointments or to ball games or helping with homework or whatever it may be. You're, you're pulled in every which direction and you hardly have time for anything else. And our children depend on us so much and we love them so much that it's really easy for us to lift them up to the highest place in our hearts and forget that God is supposed to come first. And Jesus says probably one of the hardest things that he ever says uh, in the text that we read today when he says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yeah, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now Jesus doesn't want us to hate our family. He doesn't want us to hate anybody. But he does want us to love him so much that our love for everything else just pales in comparison to that. He wants us to love him so much that if we have a choice between him and our spouse, we're going to choose him. If we have a choice between our own lives and him, we're going to choose him. That's the kind of commitment that he wants from us. So those are the people that, that came, and that was the excuses that they made. And what they sum up, guys, is that they allowed the world to come between them and the commitment that they had made. And we, this morning, are always in danger of allowing this world to come before, between us and God. And especially, now that, that applies to us as Christians. We can let the world creep in and get in our way and, and keep us from serving God the way we ought to. But it also, more so, applies to the lost. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus and you think, man, the, the kind of moral life that you've got to live as a Christian, that would just be a big hindrance to me. I like to go out with my buddies and I like to drink and I like to have fun and I... You know, I'm not always so honest on my taxes and I don't want to have to lose the extra money that I get uh, by obeying the Lord and by being moral and upright. You're letting the world get between you and eternity. Because God has prepared a banquet and a place for you in eternity where you're going to go. All these things that you struggle with today, all the, the striving and the heartache and the sickness and death and loss and all the things that have been afflicting you all your life, God has promised to wipe each and every one of those things away for all eternity. And all you have to do is agree to be with him and to come with him and to come to the place that he's prepared. All you have to do is trust that Jesus is who the Bible says he is and that he did what the Bible said he did and you can go to heaven for eternity. But you're allowing the world and you're allowing guilt and shame and money and possessions and all these things to get in between you and the Father. And it don't have to be that way. Put him first and seek first the kingdom of God with all your heart. And he said, all the rest of those things, they'll work themselves out. He'll take care of your needs. He'll take care of the money stuff. He might not make you rich, but he'll take care of you and make sure you have everything that you need as long as you're serving him and putting him first. So the man, and he, this represents what Jesus did because as I said, Jesus came to his own, his, his own received him not. So what does he do? He goes out and he says, well, I've got this big empty house. I've got all this food prepared. And he don't, I, thank God. He doesn't just throw all the food out and shut up his house and say forget about it. He says, no, I've prepared a party and I'm having the party. I've prepared a dinner and there's going to be people come to eat this dinner and to enjoy my presence. So he tells his servant, well, none of my buddies will come. They've got things that are more important to them. Why don't you just go out and gather up all the sick and the poor and the blind and the lame and all those who never would otherwise be invited to something like this? Why don't you gather them up and bring them? So the servant does that. And this to me represents when Jesus goes out in his healing ministry 
And he's going out and healing the sick and people that are demon-possessed and people that are blind and deaf. And he's healing them and bidding them to follow him and to be a part of the kingdom. So they go out and they gather up all the sick and the beggars and he comes back and he says, hey, I've got them all, but there's still room. Well, let me tell you guys this morning, there's still room in the kingdom of God. There's still room in heaven for you this morning. And until he comes back, the capacity has not been met. So you ought to just go ahead and get saved this morning so that you can go up there and spend eternity with him. So there was still room after they got the sick. And the man says, well, that's not good enough. I want it to be full capacity. Jesus wants his house to be full. And he wants as many people as will come to him to take part in his blessings. So he sends the man back out and he says, go out to the streets and bid them all to come in. And that's what we as Christians now are commanded to do, to go out into the highways and the byways and compel lost men and women to come into the house of God. That's what he sends his servant to do. And you know what kind of people this would have been as he went out into the streets and just bid whoever to come. It would have been the rough crowd. It would have been the prostitutes and the addicted and uh, all the people who were in the roughest crowd and never, ever, ever would have had an opportunity to be at this banquet, at this place, in this kind of setting. And he goes out and says, you just invite them all. Tell them to come on in. And that's what the servant does. And that's what we are doing this morning. We're out inviting all of you. All of you lost. All of you drug addicted. All of you who are suffering to come and be part of the kingdom. The man does that. And they come in. And I would imagine that they had a better time with that bunch of people than they ever would have had with the people who made the excuses not to be there. Because none of them would have appreciated it like uh, all those broken and lost and poor people who never would have had an opportunity to be in that position. That's what Jesus does this morning. He doesn't come to seek the righteous. He's come to seek those which are lost, those which are sinners, those who need a physician. And if that's you this morning, the call's going out to you. You can take part in this banquet that he's prepared. You can take part in the mansion that he's in heaven preparing for you right now. You can spend an eternity in heaven with him where you'll no longer be uh, sick, no longer suffer. You'll never have to say goodbye to a loved one again. And everything will just be perfect forever because you'll be in the presence of God for all eternity, out of the presence of sin and with your Father for as long as you live. All you have to do, the Bible says that if you would confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's all it takes this morning. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that he died on the cross and that he rose again in three days? And do you believe that that's sufficient for the payment of your sins? If you believe that, that's all it takes. You have done everything that it takes to do to be saved. Jesus did all the hard work. Now all you need to do is repent and turn away from your sins and turn toward him. Make him the Lord of your life. Gary, I guess dad took off, so um, you come up here and we'll get a song and close out. Thank you all. Now they get a song. Uh, we ask you as you stand to your feet. Uh, those of you that are tuned in online, listen to what Justin has actually delivered today. And consider, and the biggest thing that of all that is remember that when the call comes to you, don't turn it away. We find ourselves in all three categories, but it's individually up to us if we will actually heed that call. There's no respect your persons with him. That call went out to you, Jerry. It went out to Chad. It went out to Dave, Brenda, Michelle. It went to you. And it was entirely our decision, do we answer his call? And today, I want to know, will you answer that call? They're going to get a song, and we're going to open up the invitation. That invitation door was open the day Christ resurrected. And that same call that's going out some 2,000 years is still going out today. You can look around and there are no doubt in my mind there's heartache every place. There's suffering. There's loss. But in Christ Jesus, you will not suffer those losses anymore. He said, for I am able. Now listen to what he said. I am able to keep 
what you commit to me. The same spirit that was in Christ Jesus that gave him the power to pick his life back up, that's the power that he said, I'm going to give to you. If you'll give me your corruption, he said, I'll give you righteousness. If you will give me your life, he said, I will give you life eternal. What's the trade-off today? It's all of my problems in all of his life. I'm going to tell you that there is a freedom that we can walk in today. Jesus loves everybody. There is a freedom in Jesus. There's something that we struggle with all the time. We pick up things. We pack things in. We really, Jerry, has never designed to pack those burdens and those ways. Jesus said, I came that you would have life and have it more abundantly. What did that actually mean? That means that in this life only, we had hope in Christ Jesus. We'd be of all men most miserable. But there is an assurity, not the hope of the world, but a godly, righteous hope that he that begun the great work in our lives, he is able to finish it today. Will you heed his spirit? Will you answer that call? Hey, I'm speaking to the outward man. He could hear those but there's a still small voice so many that's speaking times. inside to you today. Daddy, won't Will you, you come? come to church with me today? It's just between you and him. I promise it ain't between I'll me, you, be Chad, Roger, or Jack, you or say. your mothers, your dad. It ain't between Jesus you and him. It is between you and Jesus right now. Apostle Paul wrote in the Second Corinthians. He said, "We work and we labor, that whether absent or present, we may be accepted of Him." We want that acceptance to feel like we've done a good job. We can't do it on ourselves. But he said we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive rather good or bad the deeds that we do in this body. Today, I don't know about you, but I've made a mess of things. Tom, I have really screwed up at times. But he said, I look beyond your fault and I saw your need today. The need for a savior. I promise I will you believe the report? Do everything you say. Will you heed his spirit? Jesus He's not wanting you to fix things up. That's the wonderful thing. I heard the it ain't like say. I've got to go out, Jack, and work a little bit harder. Daddy, it ain't like some people would say you have to Come you're to five miles out in sin, today. you gotta go five miles back. He said, so Daddy, as you are right won't now. You Come he said, as you are, bring it to me and learn of my ways. For my yoke is easy and my burden, it is light today. My prayer is that God's Spirit will continue to strengthen you and encourage you in your walk of life. And that if you have not made Jesus your Savior, listen to these words. Jesus said, my kingdom is is not of this world. Quit trying to put Christ's kingdom in this world together. It cannot happen. That's why he told Nicodemus, you must be born again. It's born out of the corruption of this world into a kingdom that will never be destroyed, the kingdom of heaven. That is only in Christ Jesus today. So today, our prayer is that God will continue to work with you today. Thankful for the wonderful words that Justin has brought. I pray it really give you the encouragement you need because there is a battle we face every day. We have announcements. Wednesday night, they, we will not be having youth group, but we will be having an adult Bible study. Amanda? Oh, you will be having... Scratch, scratch that. We are... Yes, we will have youth group Wednesday night, so bring all the kids out. Change up, change up, yeah, change up. I love change up, right? So we're youth group Wednesday night. Now, Thursday morning, what time will you be leaving? 
The bus is leaving at 11, so don't be a typical free meal Baptist and be here at 1115. You may miss the bus, right? There, I'm sorry. I just keep it where I'm at, right? I'm on the hills. But be here at least 15 minutes early. So the bus is leaving at 11. Amanda wants you here no later than 1045. How's that? 1045. I can tell you there are a few outreaches that this church is really good at. Number one is our outreach is with our kids here. This is a great outreach. We need to show that bonding. You'll be surprised at the youth that are still in connection today that come through youth group years ago. And they are still leaning on one another as we lean on each other. We see that growth and support them. Another one is the Appalachian Pregnancy Care Center. Our fundraiser for their baby bottles are just about up. Uh, it's coming into Father's Day, and then between Father's Day and the 1st of July, I start pulling things together, and then I take them over, typically the last week of June. If you believe in life and you don't believe in abortions, then support this fund. These people are on the front lines, and they are really making a lot of headway with unplanned pregnancies. These young ladies, when it happens and they see that it's taking place in their life, it's they just don't know what to do. But God has given them a passion. They've given them a desire and the wisdom to be able to help these young unplanned pregnancy mothers. They teach them Bible base and the baby bottles goes into what they call baby bucks as they complete these courses and they can take those baby bucks and go into a room and get things that's needful. I know we take advantage, we take for granted they don't need a, a high chair or they might need rattlers or teething things or things that babies actually need. That's what they do. And they are a supporting cast right here in the Pike County community today. So contribute if you want if you believe that pick up a bottle we got just a couple more back there put whatever change you want in it a penny goes a long ways today uh, uh, anything else we've got going on oh I, I'm glad you mentioned that sometimes I get some, if you have got, if God has blessed you and he's put it on your heart to bless this church with your offering right? There's an offering box in the back. Drop it back down in it. I promise you the money that we use goes to building the kingdom and helping people here, right? So I always said, and I'll tell you this in closing, right? If I keep my fist closed, God cannot bless me with any more. We are a funnel for God's blessings. So we're going to open up, allow them to fill us, and at the bottom that comes back into the church is only 10%. So I'll gladly take 90% of all my father wants to bless me. If all he needs is 10, wants 10% to see if I'm faithful over a few things that he can bless me over more, then by all means, just give it to me and I'll give 10. That's just what God's blessed me and I can promise you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, when you step out on faith and you start doing that, he said, try me. I'll open up the windows of heaven. I'll pour out a blessing, press down, shake together, running over. You can't contain today but try me today. That's enough said, right, Ron? We'll keep it rolling. But in closing, anything else? If I missed anything? We got your, uh, box there. Food box? Yeah, at the end of the year, uh, they actually start gathering up. Last year, you fed how many? Uh, 36. 36 families was impacted by the donations on our food boxes. So if you got a dollar or two and you want to support that, support it. God will bless you immensely. Uh, pray for our pastor. God will continue to strengthen him. Uh, anything else today? All right. If no other things need to be said, by uh, Brother Chad, will you ask our dismission, please?
Amen. Good day. God bless you. Be our prayer.